but it, 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 it's your friends basically because you told yeah. me before the interview somebody we, we, a friend we have in common just had a, a child uh, and you gave the child as a gift a unit. Yeah, so we got one more unit holder. <laughs> and <laughs> the aged and, one month. <laughs> but there, there's a huge advantage, I suppose, to knowing everybody, isn't there? I mean, the integrity factor is high there because you, you've checked everybody out, you know them. Well, yeah, but you go older and you get older and it goes down through their families, and we don't know them quite as well on the first name basis we do, but basically we know all these people. And Otherwise, they wouldn't get in. And uh, what happens when they exit, though, can they sell to somebody unsavory, or do they have to sell back to you? How does it work? Um, if they want to sell, their units are redeemed. It's an open-end pool. They can redeem the units, they can phone, and they can get out in two weeks' time, middle of the month, the end of the month, and that's what they do. And if they need some money to pay some taxes or a little extra expense in their house, they can sell. Have 100 units, sell two units, get some money to do something of that sort. They can do that. But the other thing, in the family, they can transfer the units. Ah. So you could take the father, he could pass them on to the sons or whatever he wants within the family. So we could sort of look at it in family units. And uh, it was interesting to me when I read the research because you have this nice folksiness. That's why people compare you to Buffett is the folksiness and, uh, and the simplicity and the sort of the no-nonsense aspect. And uh, you, you mentioned in there your father was president of the Royal Bank of Canada, which is like, you know, Chemical or Citibank or whatever—it was a huge institution in Canadian terms. Worked his way up from from the from the ranks, and uh, he gave you and your sister a hundred dollars a year, way back in the thirties. Well, when we were born. Yeah, and the idea was you couldn't. I spend was born it. in twenty-eight, and he was. And my sister was born in twenty-one. And you couldn't spend. Oh it. no, dividends! I mean, these those stocks <laughs> he picked had dividends. We never allowed to look at the dividends. I mean, but he gave you a hundred bucks, and what did he say? No, he bought us the stocks. A hundred dollars worth oh, of stocks each I year. I see. Um, the, your listeners might be interested to get some perspective. When he started in 1900 in the Royal Bank, he was a farmer's son in Sydney, Nova Scotia. You'd have to roll across the harbor to get a job. He paid $100 a year. If you want to look at inflation or you mm. want to look at the value of the money, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve can say it's going to go up or down or sideways. Over a long period of time, there's going to be lots of devaluations of the currency and they're going to continue to go up. So all you got to do is to look at some guy getting paid $100 a year. Indeed. It's unbelievable. But that is how you learn about compounding, you say. Yeah, you know, well, what, happened, dad, yeah what happened to go on? So I'm now 15 or 16, so father brings out these companies and the reports of the companies. Usually some of his buddies are running the company, so he, I don't know, they might see their picture, at least know some of their names. And he would say, look, the sales have gone up, and that was fine. So then I went to McGill, and I would do that each year. And then I came out, and I bought my own really first stock. And it was a silica mine in Quebec. Father in Quebec, and it was underwritten by one of my friends, I'll leave his name out, and I thought this was marvelous. It had uh, widgets and convertibles into this, that, and the other thing, and silicon. Right? And Father very smartly said to me when I asked him about it, he said, no silica mine has ever made any money in the province of Quebec. Mm. The hell with you, Father. <laughs> I'm buying it. It went bankrupt. <laughs> so that was a good lesson. Yeah. That, that, uh, that uh, you got to do your cases. homework. Yeah. We had one of these cases in McGill. Uh, we have a certain number of students in McGill run money in pools in a big two, three million dollar thing at the McGill that people put up money. So sometimes the teams come over. Uh, and one guy comes, and he was perhaps the smartest in the group. But two months ago, he got Briex just before it went down the oh, drain. Oh, the mining, yeah. So he was really upset about having put Briex in the thing. And, the thing had done pretty well. I said, that's probably the best mistake. Uh, you learn more from that than anything that you learned the and rest of your time at McGill. Now you're touching on what your foundation does in the Dobson Center at McGill. I want to talk about that. Um, entrepreneurship, you know, the word is bandied about uh, a lot, but you put your, your, your money where your mouth is. Literally, you believe in it, and, uh, and uh, you've, you've uh, endowed this center at, at McGill, and the found, your foundation endows uh, think tanks and so on that uh, preach entrepreneurship. Do you see, from your days when you started and today, do you, do you see it growing? Is it really a different spirit? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me uh, uh, perhaps explain it best in this way. Um, when we started, I'm doing it because I'm trying to get a climate that people like me can have the opportunities to invest and grow and save and build their own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So what I really think I'm doing is trying to give back to some other people, which I know is impossible, the opportunities to have some of these benefits. So it's all consistent with this question of the value of savings and the value of doing some of this and building up some equity. 
So it's all in that sort of general mode. The easiest way to look at it is to take Harvard. McGill got a new dean uh, what is it, about 12 years ago. Kraus came to Toronto. So I take him down to Harvard Business School where MacArthur, the Canadian John MacArthur, well known down there, was a dean for whatever number of terms you'd have to give him three. And I took him in. They had one fellow in entrepreneurship, professor at Harvard Business School. Uh, this would be in about 87 or 88. Mm -hmm. Next uh, year, the guy who wasn't there when we were there, so we saw another guy, he was appointed. So that was two. Four or five years later, up comes uh, MacArthur, and we have lunch with him. And uh, uh, how many guys have got not Oh, we got six. That's fine. Go a few years later, it's up mm. to 16. And one of my classmates, a fellow by the name of Bye Barnes, who used to be the captain of the Amherst football team, who lived in the next room, Bye said, John, you don't have anything to do with entrepreneurship. It's a goddamn fad. <laughs> the other guy in my class is McPherson. He had been the dean of the Stanford Business School. And he said, you go back to Montreal and you go get, and he named him Gerard Plourd because they've been in the same sort oh, of business. Oh, the United Auto Parts. Yeah, that yeah guy. I remember him. <coughs> Gerard's a tremendous guy. You go get back to get hold of Gerard and you build up entrepreneurship. So, so, it, you know, so it, can you, be, it can be bottled, right? Because, oh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, the, that's we, the point. That's how you bottle it. Or, 